your touch again. Signore, Signore. Lord, 
Send your rain. Send it, Lord. Oh, send it, Lord. Send your rain, oh, Lord. Live on the rain. the things that you can do. All I want is you. All I want is you, Lord. All I want is you. Not just the things that you can do. All I want is you. inside, Lord. All I want is you, Lord. All I want is you. Not just the things that you can do.
only you can quench this thirst of mine. I'm hungry, Lord. Feed me, Jesus. I'm hungry, Lord. I'm hungry, Lord. Only you can fill. Only you can satisfy. All I want is you, Lord. All I want is you. Not just the things that you can do. All I want is you. If you never do another good thing for me, if you never give me one more blessing, what you've already given is more than I've ever asked for, and much more, much more, much more than I deserve. But Jesus, I want you to know tonight that all I want is you, Lord. All I want is you. Not just the things that you can do. All I want is you. Yeah. Say that again. All I need you more, more than yesterday, I need you, Lord, more than words can say, I need you more than ever before, I need you, Lord, I need you, Lord. I need you more, more than yesterday, I need you, Lord, more than words can say, more than words can say. is where I really belong, Lord. My broken heart has finally found a place to call home, and I'll never be alone. No, I'll never be alone. Because you said you'd never leave me, you never forsake me. 
and I'll never be alone. I need you more. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. More than words can say. Say it to him. More than the More than the next heartbeat. More than anything. Nobody like you. Nobody like you. Sometimes I do things I don't know why I'm doing them, but I'm singing this for somebody here. If the world from you withholds all its silver and its gold, and you have to get along on meager fare. Just remember in his words how he fed the little birds. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. And if your body suffers pain and your health you can't regain, And your soul is almost sinking in despair. Jesus knows the pain you feel. He can save and he can heal. Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Leave it there. Leave it there. your burden to the Lord. Leave it there. Leave it there. 
Take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. If you'll trust and never doubt, he'll surely bring you out. Take your burden to the Lord. One more verse and I promise I'm going to move on. When your enemies assail and your heart begins to fail, don't forget that God in heaven answers prayer. He will make a way for you and he will safely lead you through. If you take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Come on, choir, sing.
like we ought to just worship him a while. Hallelujah! You've been so You could do better. Great is he who's the king of kings and the Lord. Our Lord, he is one of us. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Keep going, come on. Great is he who's the king of kings and the Lord.
sword in his hand and he's riding a white horse across this land he has fire in his eyes and the sword in his hand he's riding a white horse all across this land and he's calling out to you and me will you ride with me You see that fire in his eyes. This is love for his bride. And he's longing that she be with him right by his side. Oh, that fire in his eyes is his burning desire that his bride be with him right by his side. He's calling out to us right now. Will you ride with me? And let me be the first one to lift up my hand and say, Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes. Yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes. Just you one time. Come on, say it again. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. It's to have you here tonight. We've been looking forward to having you. How many of you here for the first time? Whew, where in the world have you folks been? Welcome, 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 welcome. 
and we have our senior pastor over there in the lounge chair taking it easy. <laughs> and on behalf of our um, board of directors and our deacons and our congregation, we're so happy you're here. We've been waiting on you. My goodness, where in the world have y'all been? We've been here almost two and a half years. Woo, took you a while to get here, but we're glad you're here. And you're not going to be disappointed, I'm telling you right now. Hallelujah. My Sing with me. This is my desire. This is my desire to honor you. To honor you, Lord, with all my heart. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Oh yes, I do. Hey, all I have within me. I give you praise. you, Lord. I was speaking at a uh, church in Richmond one time, real turned on Black Pentecostal church, and they had a morning service, and then it was kind of seamless. That one kind of faded out, and then they had another morning service that came right after it. And one woman brought her, I think it was her uncle who was unsaved, and she said, well, how did you enjoy the service? Someone was talking to him afterwards. How did you enjoy it? And he said, well, it, it, it was good. It was, it, was, it was just a little long. So what do you mean? He said, well, you know, they got to singing and, and then testifying, and then they took an offering, and then they got to preaching, and, and then they got to singing again and got to testify, and they took another offering and then got to preaching. He didn't realize he went through two straight services. <laughs> well, let me say here... We'll get to singing, then we'll get to preaching, then we'll get to singing, then we'll get to testifying, then we'll get to singing, then we'll get to the real preaching, then we'll get to the altar call, then we'll get to prayer time, then we'll get to prayer time, and it's all one service. <laughs> Hallelujah. For some of you that, uh, it struck me as I came walking up here with the Bible, some, some of them I thought, oh, this is time for the message. Friends, it's only 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> Hallelujah.
You know, I, I've also had on my heart during the worship the faithfulness of God, and Pastor Carrie Robertson got up and spoke about it for a minute, but I want to talk to you about it in another way relative to your own life and relative to revival. And by the way, this is not leading to another offering. We take one offering a night, just to clarify that part. But God said to the children of Israel in Exodus 19, you yourselves know what I did to Egypt. You've seen it with your own eyes, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter says something interesting. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. In other words, it's all over. Have you ever felt that way? That, that big lie hits you? Or that intimidating circumstance hits you? or that devastating illness, it hits you, and you look at it and you think, this is it, it's all over. They got to the point where it was beyond their ability to endure. Look at what he says, far beyond our ability to endure. He said, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us and answer to the prayers of many. I first want to say to you that God is absolutely trustworthy, and he has proven himself to be trustworthy, and he wants us to treat him and relate to him as trustworthy. In the early stage of a relationship with someone that you really don't know that well, maybe at times there are questions and there's a little mistrust, but then as the relationship solidifies, you don't go through that constant mistrust because you know the person. And I remember when I was in, in grad school, when I was doing my, my doctoral work in Old Testament Near Eastern languages, and the professors I was studying with were not believers, and they didn't take the Bible to be God's Word. And I was sure I had no questions about the truthfulness of God's Word, but I thought, you know, when they raise an honest question, I have to give us honest scrutiny. If God's Word is true and faithful, it can take honest scrutiny, and that's true. But you do it enough times, and then after a little while, whatever they say is just like water off a duck's back. It's really totally immaterial because you've proven it, and you've proven it, and you've proven it, and you don't need to prove it again. And I want to tell you tonight, whatever it is that you're praying for in terms of God moving in your church, moving in your city, moving in your nation, if you will stand faithful on your end and hold God to his promises, he will be faithful on his end. He will bring to pass what he promised. I know it may be a long wait. Someone said the greater God's purpose is for your life, the longer it'll take to be accomplished. If you want just a one-day blessing, you can manufacture that. But if you want visitation, you've got to go after God. And you've got to go after God. We've often said that the gestation period for a mouse, just a matter of some weeks, a mouse can be conceived and born, and it's just this tiny little thing. But an elephant takes something like 22 months. We don't want a little mouse, okay? We don't want just a little blessing. Oh, God, would you send revival? Oh, God, would you send revival? And in come, through the roof comes this little mouse. Now let it be something smashes through the roof and shakes the whole building. But you see, revival will not really come until you come to the end of yourself and you realize you can't make it happen. By the way, if there's something exciting happening, I'll check it out. Just people walking, nothing to be distracted by. I saw some, I saw jaws dropping and people looking and thought something was happening there. Just. People walking, unless you've all, anyone here just been raised from the dead on the way in, or? <laughs> no? Okay. Nothing out of the ordinary. But you see, what Paul went through in his own life is something that we go through in ministry, in our personal lives, in churches, where we get to a point where we can't make it happen. 
We get to a point where we look at the city, we look at the needs around us, we look at the situation, and we have no earthly answer. We cannot make revival come. We cannot change these people. We cannot impact our community. We've tried every program, every method. We've come to the end of ourselves. That's a healthy place to be. When you get down on your knees and you say, God, if you don't rend the heavens and come down, it's over. God, if you don't shake this city, it's over. If you don't bless me, I die, and I won't let you go until you bless me. So I want to tell you that God is faithful, but I also want to encourage you not to put your trust in yourself, but to look to the one who carried Egypt on eagle's wings, and I want to remind you that God is a lot smarter than we are, thank God, and he's way ahead of us. And he's not taking counsel with us to get our opinion on how he should move in the city. And I just want to tell you this last thing, because it encourages us. There was a word, how, how old was the, it was just a, a young girl, I believe, that had a word for pastor early on in the revival. It was a word from the Lord that before he had a question, the Lord would send the answer. And before there was a need, that God would already have the provision on the way. And you may look at the way things are done in the revival, and you might say, well, this is done smoothly, and boy, this is done efficiently. The brothers have said it over and over. Everything has been stumbled on. God was just being faithful. When you, you realize, I can't do it, you've got to help me. God's faithful. You say, the ushers, man, they're awesome. You talk about our head usher, Bill Bush. You said, well, how did you work that out? God worked it out. God had a man that was retired from the Coast Guard in this church, and part of his previous job description was crowd control during riot times. <laughs> when there were riots in California years ago, Bill Bush was on the job doing that on college campuses, if I have, the, if I have it right. God had him here. What a coincidence. God just happened to bring in a new worship leader. God blessed the former worship leader. He'd done a great job, but God just happened to bring in Lendl Cooley right before the revival. What a coincidence. And God happened to have an evangelist passing through to preach one message. God just did it. Amen. Everything that's happened, you know, from, from the services, from the way God works, to the workers coming into our school of ministry, it's just we kind of stumbled onto the plan of God. And I want to encourage you. you. Listen, you can't save your city. You can't shake your nation. Years back when I was involved in, in Jewish ministry and doing stuff in New York City in conjunction with Times Square Church, I said to a friend, if Brother Dave, if David Wilkerson said, you have unlimited funds to do whatever you want to do in the city, we'd have no idea what to do except, well, we don't need funds to pray, and all we can do is pray right now because we don't know. How are you going to win the Jews of New York? How are you going to win the Muslim world? How are you going to turn America back to God? How are you going to break the stronghold of secular humanism? On your knees, seeking the face of God, and then doing whatever he says. And the amazing thing is, nothing is impossible with God. And if God wants to use you to save 10 million people or to impact two people that will impact a whole generation, he can do it because it's his power. So get to a point that you don't trust in yourself. Get to a point where you recognize the solution does not lie in your wisdom, your power, your organizational skills, the size of your church, the amount of money you have in the bank, the amount of friends you have. Your solution lies in Jesus and Him alone. And He is ready to do greater things than you could ask for or imagine. Do you believe that? Amen. He's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. And my trust is that if my heart is humble before him and I lean on him, he will carry me. I am, look, I'm running. I'm striving. I'm pushing. All of us are giving everything we have till we drop just about every single day. But we're just being carried. We're just being carried. All we do is set our sail and let the wind carry us along. And you do that while you're here these days. Seek the face of God. Get everything you can. Deal ruthlessly with sin and say, God, I'm yours. And if you seek him earnestly, you will find yourself smack dab in the center of an outpouring of God in your own life and community. Amen. He's faithful.
Let me encourage you on the way out to grab a brochure about our school. I was frightened to hear in November, just trying to keep up with November, that we are getting flooded with calls now for our summer classes next year at the School of Ministry, which means we actually have to come up with a schedule now. <laughs> Someone sent an invitation about major meetings somewhere in April of 98, and I said to Scott, my assistant, well, we don't have to deal with that one for a while. He said, Mike, 98, it was 98, not 88. Did I say 88? I said 98. But it was April 98, and I, uh, I said, we don't have to deal with that one for a while. He said, Mike, 98 is next year. I thought, oh, I thought we had another year in there before 98 somehow. <laughs> it's the only church I know of that shouts for joy when, it's, uh, when we realize it's daylight savings time and we gain an hour. You're a rum yes, we get an hour. But if you grab one of the brochures and in, in a few weeks from now, call the school. We'll let you know about summer classes, one-week sessions coming up next year, 98. And uh, you can find out more about our School of Ministry. Uh, we have special sessions uh, for leaders and open to the public on Friday here. But tomorrow, uh, I believe it'll be over in the chapel. Uh, there'll be a, a, a special teaching on prayer and intercession with Lila Terhoon, who heads up our prayer ministry here. So you're all invited to be at the chapel, 11 o'clock uh, tomorrow morning. You'll be blessed, and God will speak to you and minister to you. Could you all stand to your feet, please? We want to do something special that we do every Wednesday. anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. He has sent you to the poor. Bind up the broken heart to bring freedom to the captives and to release the ones. Yeah. 
Jesus, we bless you, Lamb of God, we bless you. We bless you, we bless you, holy, hallelujah, 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 oh, we love you, Lord, we love you, Lord, we love you, Lord, hallelujah. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Everyone stand, if you would, those of you at home. Please stand to your feet. We welcome everyone listening by radio, those of you that are watching the program. God bless you for tuning it in. And I want everyone to pray, those of us in this main sanctuary, those of us watching from other areas. I want everyone to pray together. We're going to ask the Lord to speak to our hearts and to change our lives. We've been praying this, this prayer ever since Father's Day of 1995, been asking the Lord to speak to our hearts. And regardless, friend, of how old you are in Jesus, if you've known the Lord for 50 years, you still need changing. And many of you in this room don't know the Lord. You've never met him. You don't know Jesus. Somebody brought you here. Maybe you don't even believe in God, and I want to welcome you. You're here because God brought you here. And uh, you don't need to lie to anybody and say you're a Christian if you're not, okay? That's a lie that I'm trying to do my very best to eradicate from this nation is this, this fallacy that everyone's a Christian. And a Christian is a follower of Christ. And a follower of Christ is one who doesn't live in sin. <clears throat> So if you call yourself a Christian, then you live like Jesus lived, okay? If not, then I would do my very best to not call myself a Christian and call myself heathen, or there's a, there's a group out, you can, you can reach them on the internet, it's a group all over America, they call themselves pagans, and you can email the pagans, you can write them, you can talk back and forth with them, they, they blatantly say they're pagans, they blatantly call themselves that, but if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then you need to live for him. Okay? That's one of the reasons America is in such sad shape. Some of the nations that I've been to and some of the nations Mike's been to, if you called yourself a Christian, matter of fact, you would never call yourself a Christian unless you're willing to pay a price. You wouldn't walk around saying, I'm a Christian, because you'd get stoned. Okay, so there it's not really popular to say you're a Christian, but here in this nation, you just sort of fall into that, and it's really not that way at all. So if you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord, God's brought you here, you're here under divine appointment. I believe everyone here has been brought to the Lord, whether or not you've been drugged into this place. You could have come in here out of anger, and you could be here out of criticism. You just came to criticize. And you hate this place, you hate this church, you hate Lyndall Cooley, you hate the choir, you hate me, you hate the color of the pulpit, you just hate this place. I welcome you, we love you. Welcome. I'm glad you're here.
And you may be here out of anger because your wife got saved last week. <laughs> this happens so many times, friend. Or your husband, and you're mad, okay, because she quit doing drugs with you, or she quit drinking, or she won't go to the bars anymore. Now she wants to live for Jesus. And so you've come here because you're mad, and you've come here to prove to her that everything that she heard at the Brownsville Revival is not true. But let me tell you something, sir, ma'am. God's going to get a hold of you tonight. God's going to get a hold of you. You can't get away from him, okay, because it's not here. He's everywhere. I want everyone to pray with me right now. Out loud, everyone within the sound of my voice, pray out loud. Everyone together. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak to my heart. Speak to my heart. Change, my life. Change my life. In your precious name. Your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Something's happening right now. Something's happening. I, Pastor and I were talking at the beginning of this service. The glory of God is in this place. And I don't know what he's up to. Okay? I don't know what God's got planned. How many came to get a touch from God? How many will let God touch them any way he wants? We'll see. A, we've had God do some unusual things here. I was um, talking yesterday or day before yesterday with the New York Times, and, and they called, and, and um, he said they're doing an article, and they'd already done an incredible article on the Brownsville Revival that gave us front-page coverage. And he said, we're doing another article. I thought, dear God, what's this one going to be? You know, the first one was great. And, you know, so you wonder the second time, you know, is it going to be a, just a slam on it? He goes, no, we're doing, a, we're doing an article. Now, this is not Charisma or Christianity Today. This is the New York Times. And he said, we're doing an article on the history of the Pentecostal movement in America over the last hundred years. And they said, it's called From Azusa Street to Brownsville. And I said, he said, do you like the title? I said, yeah, that's, that's a good title. And so I began to interview the guy, you know, about, you know, what, where his information is coming from. He started spilling off all these people he's interviewing, and the guy is doing his homework, friend. I mean, it's solid as a rock. And uh, he's been here to the revival. He's seen what God is doing, and he's seen the power come down. And that's one of the reasons he's calling it from Azusa Street to Brownsville, because he knows 100 years ago, about 100 years ago in California, the power came down, and he read all about that. He did all his research on that. Then he was here for five days, and he saw the power come down here. I said that to say this, the power is coming down in this place, and God, God can do anything he wants. And uh, he, friend, he may do something unusual with you. You may have a vision. You may see angels. I have not seen angels, okay? But a lot of people have seen it. I want to see angels, okay? <laughs> I would settle for an angel, angel feather or anything, just, <laughs> or a, just a halo or... I've even looked up at the lights and squinted and opened up again just to, hoping I would see something up there, but... We've had so many angel sightings, and the, the sightings have been, most of them have been from brilliant people, you know, people that, when, some folks in this community that, that are well-educated and, and are not given to seeing things, and then a lot of children have seen angels. We've had people stand in front of us, well-dressed, well intelligent people say, can't you see them? <laughs> and it makes you feel like an idiot, and you go, no! They're right there. Look at them, man. They're at least 15 feet tall. There's three of them. They're looking at you. I'm so... I go, Jesus, what's wrong with me? You know, Billy Graham wrote a book on angels, you know. He believes angels are everywhere. They're here. They're here to see. You read the, the book of Acts. They hung around the church. 
What's happened to the church today, friend? Think about it. If the early church was the beginning and, and things are supposed to be getting better, you know, the power of greater things we're going to see in his name, then where are the angels? I mean, come on. I, how many would love to see a couple here or there? Well, this is the season, you know, Christmas, angels. And, you know, anytime you're ready. <laughs> I think the problem is some of us aren't. If we saw one, we'd write a book. How to see angels. <laughs> but God is going to touch your life tonight, friend. Anything can happen to you. And uh, we had, I remember the Washington Post wrote a great article about this revival. And by the way, the po Washington Post reminded me the other day, he said, Steve, would you tell the people that we don't hate Christians? And uh, I told him I would tell you that. He said, because we, we're slammed by everybody who thinks that the Washington Post is so secular and is a hater of God. And he said, would you tell the people at the revival that we don't hate God? And so I'm telling everybody here. But he, they came here and, and sat in this place and stayed till like 1.30 in the morning till the last person was dumped out of this sanctuary. And, and uh, <laughs> he was back there with his pen and paper just writing, one of these old-timey reporters, you know, the best in the market. When they got their little pad of paper, you know they're good, man. No recorders, you know, just writing it all down. And, and uh, he, he said about 1 o'clock, uh, they, they began to pick up the slain in the Lord. Okay, you think of this, you know, this is a, a reporter who's never been in anything like this. They begin to pick up the slain in the Lord, pick up their bodies and carry them outside the church and lay them in the, in the, the cool grass, okay, <laughs> under the moonlight. So, so he's just following these people, carrying these bodies out, <laughs> only, only to wake up under the moonlight and stumble off to their cars. So um, and the title of the article was, What in God's Name? <laughs> It's a great article, by the way. It's fantastic. So God could get a hold of you tonight, friend. Just let him have his way. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Say what? Who did, what's that? Every, everyone stand together. Fuego. Acts 9. Fire! Acts 9. Fire! Acts 9. Fire! That's good. I like that. <laughs> Verse 36. <laughs> Acts 8. Fire! All right. Doesn't have to do with the chapter. <laughs> Acts 9, 36. Fire! All right. Now in... How many ask the Lord to speak to their hearts and change their lives? Let's read the scripture. Now in Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and, care and charity, which she continually did. And it came about at the time that she fell sick and died, and when they had washed her body, they laid it in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, having heard that Peter was there, sent two men to him, entreating him, do not delay to come to us. And Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing all the tunics and garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. Verse 40, but Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise and she opened her eyes and when she saw Peter she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up and calling the saints and widows he presented her alive and it became known all over Joppa and many believed in the Lord and it came back that he stayed many days in Joppa with a certain tanner named Simon you may be seated all rise is the name of this message All rise. Acts. Fire! That's good. First Peter. 
<laughs> it's the book. I'm nailing this down now. It has to do with the book. Echos. Ah, very good. Got you on that one. That was Acts in Spanish. I'll say Echos, you say Fuego. Echos. That's better. All right. Whew. This is a miracle that took place in the midst of an incredible revival. The early church was bursting at the seams. Thousands upon thousands were being added. Discipleship, powerful Bible teaching, prayer, anointed preaching, and incredible healings were all part of an average day in the early church. You'll read earlier in this chapter in the book of Acts. <laughs> you set them up. <laughs> Are y'all going to do this all week? You read earlier in chapter 9 how, as a matter of fact, look there with me, the beginning of chapter 9. For those of you that have a problem with the power coming down, I have a problem with the power not coming down. <clears throat> Regardless of the denomination you're from tonight, most of you, if you're teaching the Word, will teach the Pauline epistles, the books that Paul wrote, the letters that he wrote to Corinth, to Romans. But very rarely do you hear people talking about Paul's conversion because Paul's conversion, you'll read it in Acts chapter 9, was violent. It was very unreligious. Say that with me, unreligious. It was not normal the way he got saved. Yet we'll use his teachings, we'll read his letters, we, we esteem him as the greatest apostle that ever lived. But no one wants to talk about his beginning. His beginning was violent. You read the first few verses in chapter 9 for yourself. You can read it when you get home, but look at this. Verse 4, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice. Friend, if you walked up to Saul of Tarsus and handed him a track, he would have thrown you in jail probably. Saul was not the kind of person that you would give a track to. Saul is not the kind of person you'd give the four spiritual laws to. Saul was the type of person that hated you. This world is full of people like that. There's, this world is full of people that don't want anything to do with Christianity. I was explaining to someone a few minutes ago how I've watched Muslims hit by the power of God in this place. And see, I want Muslims saved, but I don't want to spend my life trying to convince them of Jesus. I would rather the power come down. I'd rather the power come down and hit them just one time. See, when the power comes down and you're on the ground and you can't get up, you're going to listen. Okay? It's another thing to be standing up with your car or some book, you know, and you're battling it out with somebody, but it's a whole different ball game when you're on the ground pinned by the power of God. Then I don't have to say a thing. It's just like, okay, deal with it, son. I don't have a hand on you. Take care. Get up. I've looked at people and said, get up. Get up. They try to get up. Get up. They can't get up. What is that? Big grown man, six foot tall, 245 pounds, can't get up. God's dealing with you down there. He's getting a hold of people and get used to it. Those of you from denominations that have never seen it happen, God's got to get a hold of this nation. Saul of Tarsus was hit. He was hit. A blinding light shone from the sky at noonday. He fell to the ground. The Bible doesn't say he was riding a horse or donkey or walking down. It doesn't say that, friend. It doesn't matter what happened. He fell. He hit the dust. And down on the ground, he heard a voice. He spoke to the voice. He was blinded. This is not something you'd find in the Old Testament. See, the Scriptures, they had the Old Testament. But if Saul was looking for this experience in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, you, you wouldn't find it. You won't find it in the book of Genesis. It's not there. Some of you that are saying, well, you know, anything that happens to me now, I better be able to find every jot and tittle of it in the book. Well, what would Saul do? It wasn't in there, friend. 
It was called an experience with God. Stay with me. Some of you are bothered by that. Down to the ground, blinding light, let off. Three days later, he's prayed for, and something like scales fall from his eyes. Now, here's the catch. He was changed forever. Okay? And that's what I, I, I want to lay that foundation before we go any further. You can fall backward. You can fall forward. You can shake. You can jump up and down like a pogo stick. I want to know, are you living for Jesus when you walk out this door? Is your life changed? Because that's all that matters. That's all that matters. You cannot like shouting. You cannot like jumping. You cannot like loud worship. That's fine. I want to know, are you on fire for Jesus? Are you on fire for Jesus? That's the big question, friend. I don't know who needed to hear that, but you got it anyway. Let me give you some points. I was looking over this scripture today, friend, and so much came to mind, and I'm praying, God, sort this out tonight because I don't want to give too much. First of all, let me say this about this woman named Dorcas. She was a wonderful, godly woman. You listening? And I want to say this. I've never said this in the revival. I want to say it, you know, as I've traveled all over this nation, most of the churches I go to will have a Dorcas ministry. They will have a women's ministry called the Dorcas Women's Ministry or the Dorcas Group or the Dorcas Women's Group. And it has to do with, with caring and sharing and giving and, and hospitality and, and loving people, taking care of people. And I want to say something to the women. I remember when Jerry and I first began our missions work, we would travel around this nation raising funds to work in Argentina and other areas. Matter of fact, the, the one we planted our very first church with is with us tonight back in 1986 and 87. Uh, Hector Manzolito y Marga, que se pongan de pie. Let's give them a hand tonight. And we would travel around the nation and, and inevitably a, a lady would come up in a church and say, we've made something for you. Our Dorcas group has made something for you. And they'd come up with the most beautiful quilts, the most beautiful things, friend, and they'd give them to us and it would, we'd cherish them. And the, the love that they showed us as we, as we travel around this nation, and many of you have been touched by women's ministries, and I want to say this before going any deeper into this message how much I appreciate, and we appreciate as pastoral staff here, as an evangelist, how much we appreciate the women in the church and your ministry to the body of Christ. I'd like for all the women to stand right now. All the women, just stand. This is an appreciation of you. Because sometimes I know it goes unnoticed, but God's taking an account. My first point tonight in this message entitled, All Rise, is there must be a death before a resurrection. There must be a death before a resurrection. Now, this is story is, is a marvelous story, and, and when I said what Peter said, Tabitha, arise, I heard, hallelujah, glory to God, bless the Lord all over this congregation. That's uplifting. But let's go back a little bit. There's got to be a death before there's a resurrection. Everyone in this room is here to receive from God. Some of you in this place are spiritually dead. You're dead. It's over. Others of you are dying spiritually. Some of you may be on fire for God, but others may not realize how bad off you really are. But there's got to be a death before there's a resurrection. Let me lay this foundation. We're going to go a little different route tonight with Dorcas's life. I'm not going to talk about physically heal physical healing. I'm not going to talk about, about being physically raised from the dead. We're spiritualizing this, friend. Tonight, you have got to realize that there must be a death. If you want God to touch your life mightily, you've got to die. You've got to die, and it was already said tonight twice through Mike Brown and Kerry Robertson. It's already been said tonight about being raised from the dead. I don't know if you gentlemen realize you said what you said tonight. But you've got to be willing, friend, 
to lay it all down, all your dreams, all your goals, all your visions. I believe it was Carrie Robinson talked about programs. We have every program imaginable. You have all your ideas, all your ways and your means of doing things. You've got to lay that all down, friend. There's got to be a death before there's going to be a resurrection. The grain of wheat has got to fall to the ground and die before it's going to bring forth fruit. Is anyone listening tonight? There's got to be a death. If you're here tonight and you're a drug addict, you're an alcoholic, you've got to come to the place where you are destitute, you are dying, you are at a place, I can't go on anymore, it's over, I can't live any longer, and your death has, is imminent. That's where Christ can begin a work. There's got to be a death before there's a resurrection. I don't believe everyone understands it yet. I'm going to make sure you do, friend. If you're here tonight and you're a, uh, a pastor of a large church or you're an evangelist that's been successful, I've heard everything under the sun in this place. People coming in and they act like they're, 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 they're snobs, okay? Let me explain something to you, friend. We've had billionaires come here. We've had country singers. We've had senators, congressmen, governors, families come to this revival. No one's ever recognized. Are you listening? We don't care. It doesn't matter. We're nobodies. I crawl out here every night, and I crawl out of here every night. We're all scum. We're all dirt. And if you're in this place, you've come to this place, and you're somebody, you're so-and-so from this church, and it's fine to mention what church you're from, but if there's an elevated opinion about yourself, friend, that's not a vessel God can use very much. I've had, I remember one young man was brought here to me and, and he came up to me and he said, he said, I'm from the Southern Baptists and, and they're grooming me to be the next Billy Graham. And I thought, you're not groomed to be the next Billy Graham, you know. That's impossible to be groomed to be the next Billy Graham. Either God makes another man like that or he doesn't. But there was an arrogance about him. He said, I come here just to check out and see what's going on in this place. This is awesome, man. This is really cool. You know, and then he walked out. Other time, we have pastors coming in just bragging on themselves. I've done this. I've done that. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. There's no death there, friend. And without a death, there ain't going to be no resurrection. See, John Kilpatrick did something. He came into this church, and he grabbed the keys. Charlie, bring me my keys out of there. Doug, bring me the keys out of this thing, this, the side zipper case. He brought his keys to this church, and pastor, correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong on this. But it was early one morning. He was praying. And he had the keys to the church. And he said this. He was all alone. I believe he was wearing a jogging suit or something. Just came over here barefooted maybe, just praying alone like some of you pastors do in your church. Nobody's there, just you and Jesus. His big old vacant sanctuary, and he's walking around. And he takes the keys and he lays them on the altar. And he says, Jesus, here's my keys. This doesn't mean anything to me. What means anything to me, Jesus, is you and a move of God. And Lord, I will move to a little country church of 50 people if that's what it means to have revival. Latest keys. You know what that was? That's death. That's dying, friend. That's where revival starts. Heaven looks down and goes, man, I can handle that. That's good. That's a solid foundation. But if the man walked in here and went, hey, heaven, look down here. Look what I built for you, Jesus. Fill it up. Fill it up, God. Man, we got the best program. We got the money. We got this. We got that. Jesus, come on now. You've heard me preach. Man, God's, God's out of town, man. <laughs> he left town. Trust me. There's got to be a death, friend. There's got to be a death. Those of you with sin in your life tonight, I'm talking about every last sin. Anything that's there, if you haven't died to it, if you're here today and you're from Sweden or you're from Germany or Japan or you're from California, New York, wherever you might be from and you're in this place and you love God, you love this, you love that, you want revival, but you love other women also. You love a little, a little lust here and there. Ain't gonna cut it, friend, you ain't dead. You ain't dead. There ain't going to be no resurrection, friend. God's not going to raise you up until you totally die to all that stuff. Is anybody listening? Yeah. The Lord's laying the foundation tonight, friend. I preached, I believe, two and a half years ago on this woman 
it's a totally different message, but one of the things I made sure everyone under understood is that Dorcas was dead. Say that with me. Dorcas was dead. She had died. This is a foundational truth right here, friend. You can underline it. She was dead. Whoo. I skipped three pages just then. God's up to something tonight. The second point. In order for there to be a resurrection, the dead must come in contact with a power greater than death. Now, this is elementary, friend, but the gospel's elementary. In order for there to be a resurrection, the dead must come in contact with a power greater than, the de than death itself, which is the power of Christ. Now, let me tell you some of the people that visited Dorcas. See, she had been in contact with a lot of people since she had died. Her corpse was lying there. Doug, bring that out to me, that little jar. Bring me a couple prayer cloths, Charity. People had come up to her. These are, some of these are impromptu. You can sort of tell here. But this right here is a tear bottle. How many have read in the Word about how, put your tear, my tears in your bottle, O oh Lord? This right here is a tear bottle. It's 3,000 years old, dug up in Jerusalem. This was common in those days when, when, when the psalmist said, Lord, put my tears in your bottle. The Lord knew exactly what he was talking about because this was the most precious item that people owned. As a matter of fact, some theologians believe the woman that washed Jesus' feet with her tears actually wept, but she took her tear bottle and popped the cork on it and poured the tears all over Jesus' feet. The tear bottle is what you collected all through your life of when you mourned and you grieved over someone. If your son died, you would take the tear bottle off the shelf and the priest would come over and hold a piece of cotton to your eye and the tears would drip in the cotton. He'd squeeze it into the jar and then cap it. And that was a memorial to your son. That's why the psalmist said, hide my tears, my most precious tears in your bottle. See my tears. And so perhaps... Dorcas had many women hanging around her with their tear bottles. They loved this woman. She was a godly woman. She had done great things. And in their hand, one hand, they had a tunic that she had created, a beautiful purple cloth. And they were so thrilled at what she had made. Now she's gone. And they're holding the tear bottle, weeping, dripping tears into the bottle and showing to Peter, look what she made me. Look at this. It's precious. She, she made this. And she taught us all. Look what she taught us how to make she taught me to how to make this tunic, and she taught me to how to make, I made this for my husband. She just taught me this a few days ago, how to knit, and I've made this for my husband. And these people were hanging around Dorcas. They were right around her, friend, but there was no power in any of that. There was no power in the mournful tears. There was no power in that tear bottle. Is anybody listening tonight? There was no power in the friendships. And I'm telling you tonight, there's no power. If you're in sin tonight, there, are no, there is no power to raise you up in the people that you've made acquaintances with over the years. Dorcas had a lot of friends. They were hanging around her mourning, but they could not raise her from the dead, friend. There was no power there, and that's how your friends are. They will look at you in your misery. They'll say, man, look at Steve Hill. He's been on drugs all these years. I wish he could get better, but they can't make me better, friend. There's no power in your friends, and there never will be. Is anybody listening tonight? You got to come in contact with a power greater than death. I can feel this tonight, Pastor. The power of social influence. I don't care how they praise you, friend. You can be laying in that casket tonight. You can be laying on that slab tonight. And people, and you know, maybe, you know, you're a pastor here tonight, but you know spiritually you're dead. You know, there's something wrong with you, man. There's a sin that's crept into your life. Something's wrong. But people can come up to you and say, Pastor, Pastor, what a message. You're my kind of preacher, Pastor. I've never heard preaching like that. That's what they're doing with Dorcas. But it ain't going to raise you from the dead, friend. It's not going to raise you up. They can make you social. They can make everyone around you socially aware of how good of a person you were or are. But it ain't going to do you no good. See, it doesn't matter what people say about Steve Hill. It doesn't matter what people say about John Kilpatrick. God knows me. God knows him. God knows us intimately. 
Some of y'all need to hear that tonight. You need to shake off the praises of man. I've had so many people ask me, what's it like this? What's it like? It's like nothing. Okay? Period. Everywhere you go, people know you. So what? It's like nothing. You don't feel a thing, friend. There's no, there's no pride. There's no glory. And there's no, I've had someone say to me the other day, they said, man, you treat me like you treated me three years ago, Steve. You know, you're just my buddy, my friend. I, what kind of statement's that? You know, you're still my buddy, still my friend. And, but now you're known all over the world and everybody's, so what? What is that? What is that? So somebody says you're famous. Somebody came from another European country and says you're known all over our country. If you'd come, you'd pack out stadiums. You know what that does, friend? That goes in one ear and out the other. It's like, so? So? I might die tomorrow, friend, too, you know? Whew. Shake it off. All your little successes in life won't raise you up. All your education, your ability to make tunics and aprons, all the great things, friend, if you're spiritually dead, you've got to come in contact with the one who can raise you up. Well, he's a presbyter. He's an executive presbyter. He's this, he's that. Hogwash. For those of you translating from other nations, Hogwash is dirty pig water. <laughs> I hurt for him sometimes, friend. Whew. In order for there to be a resurrection, the dead must come in contact with a power greater than death. Whew. Absolutely. I tell you what, I don't know what God's doing here tonight through this message. I'm... I'm skipping it, all these notes. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> it's all right. It is God who chooses the means to bring the dead back to life. It is, see, you're dead, okay? Dorcas didn't have a thing to say about it. How many would agree on that? Any theologians in the house going to argue with me? Mike, was Dorcas dead? Precisely. Mike's our resident theologian, and he believes she was dead. I believe she was dead. How many believe she was dead? She had no vote, friend, how she was going to be raised from the dead. Let me say that to you, those of you in this room that are already angry, okay? You're dead spiritually. You're in sin, but you're angry. Get over it, friend. You ain't got a choice. God's coming to you tonight whether you like it or not. He's going to get a hold of you. He's going to shake your bone. He's going to get a hold of your life tonight, friend. Who are you? Who are you to choose how and who God uses to raise the dead? We had a military man here the other day. He was up on the balcony. He just got mad, man, during a meeting. Just ticked. It was a Saturday night. This is last Saturday. Saturday before last, excuse me, right up there, and he got mad. Why? Well, he was on his, he was on that slab, and he was trying to pick, you know, who he was going to get to raise the dead, to raise him up. He didn't like it here, didn't like nothing about it, so he stomped out of this place. Dead man walking, friend. He got in his car, drove home, turned on the television set Saturday night, and I was preaching on the television set. He couldn't believe it. God was trying to make himself known to the man. So he comes back. So this is the second time this kind of thing's happened to people. He comes back the next Sunday morning, and he gets saved right here in this church. Why? You ain't got a choice, friend. You're dead. Now, your choice is coming in just a minute, but who God uses, who God uses and how he uses to get a hold of you is up to God. It can be tracks. Someone could walk up to you in the mall and give you a tract that said, Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. Someone could, could, you could, you could be at a J.C. Penney looking at television sets and, and, and they're, they're flipping all the remotes and, and John Hagee's there screaming at you. That's what God chose to speak to you, friend. It's not up to you. It's interesting to me who God chose this time. He chose Peter. You know, up to this time, that apostles had been healing 
ankle bones and, and palsy and di divers diseases. They've been casting out unclean spirits, but they hadn't raised the dead yet, man. This was new stuff. How many love new stuff? This is new stuff. And Jesus just said, hmm, Peter, good man for this job. Friend, revival is full of new stuff. Can I say that? Revival is good, it's full of all kinds of new, if you're not willing to venture out in revival, is everybody listening? Then God's going to pass you by, friend. What would have happened? What would have happened if Peter had decided, I think it was a six-mile journey to Joppa to get to there where this woman was. What would have happened if he had decided not to go? He had heard that she was dead, and he was scared. He didn't want to experience that. You know, some of you don't want to lay hands on a man in a wheelchair. You don't want to lay hands on a person that's blind. Why? You're scared. It's not you anyhow, friend. If God opens those eyes, God opens those eyes. If he rises from the chair, he rises from the chair. This was new to them. I can imagine what Peter did when he walked in that room. He looked at her, and he looked down at his, he pulled up his sleeve and looked at his WWJD bracelet. <laughs> Anybody got one of them? Give me your bracelet. Some of these folks don't know what they are. Right here. He pulled out his bracelet. And, uh, yeah, these things have been around a long time, friend. They might just now be on the market, but they've been, they've been on people's hearts for centuries. What would Jesus do? Peter looks down. He sees his bracelet, because, you know, he's never raised anybody from the dead. You know, this ain't, a, this ain't a, you know, we're not talking about stretching out a leg. This is raising a woman from the dead. This is serious business. This is God on the line. This is not one of those, you know, on my back hurt and now it doesn't feel as bad type of thing. This is a real McCoy, a real healing. What would Jesus do? And he remembered back Jairus' daughter. He remembered. I promise you this is what happened. What did he do? He cleared the room. What did Jesus do? He cleared the room. He got all the people out. Peter just went, what would Jesus do? You everybody get out of here. What would Jesus do? <laughs> it's just one, two, three. You can't miss, friend, when you follow what Jesus would do. So God can choose the means to bring the dead back to life. It can be a message at the Brownsville Revival. We, met, we preach, friend, we preach on the love of Christ. We preach on the, the resurrection. We preach on the cross. We preach on Jonah, Moses, Peter, Paul, Mary, Peter, Paul, and Mary. <laughs> we preach all kinds of messages in this place. And you might be coming in today and you're going, man, this is a hard message tonight, man. He's really nailing us. Friend, this is soft. <laughs> this is soft, okay? If you think this is hard, I mean, this is soft. You need to get some of the messages like the... the uh, Check the tree. How about that one, okay? Check the tree is, is where Jesus, the story of the vineyard, of the fig trees, and there's this tree that did not bear forth fruit, okay? And the keeper of the vineyard said he's been looking for fruit for a year or three years. Is it three years? Three years. And fig trees are supposed to bear forth fruit three times a year. That's nine visits that the owner of the vineyard made to that tree to get some fruit, and there was nothing. Nine times, friend, you're out. I mean, that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of patience right there. And the owner of the vineyard, the keeper of the vineyard said, please give me one more year to tenderize it, to, to, to pour in water, to care for it. Give me one more year to fertilize it, and then you can chop it down. Well, that night, friend, you could hear a pin drop in this place because about that time I brought out an ax, and it was a huge, broad ax, a 120-year-old ax. The head of it's about this big, and it'll chop down a tree. And I carried that thing around. People were, people were praying, man. 
But, but I was walking around with that axe, and I was explaining to folks that you might be at the end of that last year, and the Lord is still looking for fruit. He's still looking, and all he finds is leaves. There's no fruit. The Lord didn't plant you for leaves. Fig trees were great for shade. People would hang out under fig trees. But I want to tell you, a fig tree farmer don't want figs. He leaves. He wants figs. So he's going to come up to you, friend. And I told the folks, I said, you can hear the shed door opening and the cart moving towards the shed, the axe being laid on the back of the cart, the car being brought out to the field. Maybe right now the keeper of the vineyard is picking up the axe. Maybe he's walking over to the tree. Maybe he's got it up in, his, in the air. Maybe it's almost at the base of the root. That was a hard message. And that's exactly what some people needed to hear that particular night. See, God can choose how he wants to raise the dead. He can scare you out of death itself, friend. As a matter of fact, that night, a lady took that message home to her husband, who was a deacon in a major church, a church of over 7,000 members. Been living in sin for years. Blatant sin. She brought that thing to him and said, watch this. And he watched it. He went to the church and for four hours repented to the pastor. Four hours, and the pastor called me and said, Steve, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I've known this man. And see, that's what God wanted to use to raise that man from the dead. The fact that God will chop, chop your tree down. Is anybody listening, friend? It is God who chooses the means to bring the dead back to life. My next point is this. Your personal resurrection hinges on your response. It hinges on your response. See, I'm doing my part tonight, friend. I'm going to preach the Word. I'm going to tell about Jesus, how much He loves you and has a plan for your life. How Jesus was told of by John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And how Jesus lived a perfect life. And at the end of his perfect life, they crucified him. They beat him. They whipped him. They stripped him. They spat upon him. They cursed him. But he endured it all. He did it all for you. He drugged the cross up to the top of Mount Calvary. They laid him on it after his back had already been ripped to shreds like pastor preaches from the nap of his neck to his buttocks had been whipped, had been raked with a plow, was ripped open. He was a bloody, mangled mess. They laid him on that beam. They stripped his clothes off. Most theologians believe he was totally naked on the cross. They nailed his hands. They nailed his feet. They put him on top of Mount Calvary, not behind it, on top of it, friend. So everyone could see his nakedness. Everyone could behold the Lamb of God. And if that wasn't enough, the religious leaders and the bystanders begin wagging their heads at him, saying things like, if you're the Son of God, get off the cross. Save yourself. Jesus, knowing all along, he could do it in a heartbeat. He kept on, and he kept on, and he kept on, friend. And he looked out at you and me in 1997, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The Bible records two thieves, one on the left and one on the right, that were cursing him and mocking him back and forth. And then one of them, the Bible explains, had a change of heart. I believe Luke talks about it. And he turns to Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you enter into, his, into your kingdom. I believe the thief, when he heard Jesus say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's when I believe he stopped cursing and stopped mocking Jesus and he had that change of heart. Some of you think that's a contradiction in the Word of God. I think it's Matthew and Luke. It's not a contradiction, friend. 
It's not a contradiction at all. I believe one of the thieves had a change of heart right in mid-swing. And he turned, he said, remember me. And Jesus, this is the love of a Savior. Rather than look at that man and say, you cursed, vile human being. Just 30 seconds ago, you were cursing me. Just 30 seconds ago, you were mocking me. Just 30, you're hanging on the cross just like me. Don't you understand? And you were making fun of me 30 seconds ago, and now you want me to forgive you. Now you want me to have you enter in my kingdom. Forget you, man. No, Jesus said, hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. What a Savior! What a Lord! How many of us in this room have cursed the Lord, cursed the Lord, even today used his name in vain, cursed him, cursed him, cursed him, and then we go right to the altar. We say, Jesus, forgive me. And you know what he does? He forgives you. What a Savior. See, I explained that all to you, friend. I do my part. Peter did his part, Pastor. He went up to, he went up to Tabitha. Tabitha, she had two names, Dorcas and Tabitha. And by the way, Tabitha means gazelle. It's a wonderful creature. She was a lovely human being. And he says, Tabitha, arise. See, that was his part. That's my part. My part is to come in here and preach the gospel. My part is to come and make it plain and simple. Peter didn't explain anything to her. He said, Tabitha, arise. By the way, we've already cleared the room of all distractions. Have you noticed there's no distractions here tonight, friend? You want to know why there aren't any distractions? We have ushers everywhere. See, Peter got out all the people out of the room. Those were distractions. You notice how quiet it is in here? Sometimes we'll have people standing up in the middle of this service, and they'll cuss me out right in the middle of it. Last week it happened. Somebody stood up and started cussing at me. I just kept on preaching. The ushers take them. They carry the person out. We deal with it all the time, friend. Why? Because of you. Because of all the Tabithas. All the Dorcases that are in the room that are going to rise in just a few minutes. God's going to do a mighty work. All the distractions are taken care of by the Holy Ghost. They're dealt with. Have you ever noticed how people don't rise up and prophesy in this place? Ever notice how people don't just jump up and give words in tongues all the time? You want to know why? It's easy. We got rules. You can prophesy if you want. But if you're going to prophesy, if you got a word from the Lord... Then we want a, a letter from your pastor on his stationery from his church saying you're a member in good standing and that you're up to date on your tithing. And when we, and when we mentioned that, we made that statement many, many times in the revival. It spread like wildfire around the nation. Don't go prophesy down there. <laughs> they, want, they, want, you know, they want faithful people to be prophesying. Hello. <laughs> Godly people to be prophesying. So if you ain't in good standing with your local church, and if you ain't up to date on your tithe record, shut your mouth. You have nothing to say to the body of Christ. Peter had done his. The distractions were gone. He got out all the women and all the, all the other widows in the room. It was just Peter and Tabitha. He says, Tabitha, arise. Now, my point is this. Your personal resurrection hinges on your response. In just a minute, I'm going to give an altar call. What does the Bible say in the book of Acts? After he said, Tabitha, rise, the Bible says this. Peter reached over, put one finger on her upper eyelid and one finger on her lower eyelid and pried them open. It ain't in there, friend. Is it in the original Greek like that, Mike? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Actually, Steve, you know, it, the original text. <laughs> it's rough being around this guy, friend, trust me. It's great having commentaries and, you know, stuff in the office and in my study, but having a Mike Brown around all the time is wonderful. 
The Bible says she opened her eyes. You listening? I tend to remember a time that, that a man came out of a tomb. Lazarus, come forth. He came forth. He's the one that walked out. John Davis, who is here quite a bit with us, he said the reason Jesus had to call out his name, because if he didn't call out his name, every tomb in the place. <laughs> Don't you know all them other dead people are going, <laughs> come on now, Jesus. But she opened her eyes. And the Bible says she sat up. That was her part. Her part in her own resurrection. And in this altar call, in just a minute, friend, you're going to open your eyes. You're going to sit up. You're going to do something about it, friend. It's not always up to somebody else. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to show God how serious you are about living. Is anybody listening? Hope you're listening at home. Because I want to tell you, one of the reasons some of you are watching this at home or listening on the radio, and I know there's some re there, there's bedridden folks that you can't come to revival or you're watching this or listening to it in, in Maine or Pittsburgh or somewhere like that, but a lot of folks, they watch this program or they listen to it because they're spiritually dead. And you heard something. As a matter of fact, there's a man watching this. You've heard, you probably listened to 10 of my messages, and you're still just sitting there. I'm telling you tonight, friend, if you're expecting God to zap you, you've got to want something from God. You've got to want him. The reason Saul of Tarsus had such a powerful turnaround is because he was a sincere man. Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9 felt like he was doing his religious duty. And when God got a hold of him in the real McCoy, the real McCoy way, Saul turned on a dime. You're going to have to have a heart after God, sir. You're going to have to want to rise up. I'm not going to walk into your bedroom and open your eyes. I'm not going to get you and pick you up out of bed and stand you up. You're going to have to do that on your own, sir. It's time for you to do something on your own. It's time for you to rise up. You know I'm speaking to you. You know I am. So in just a minute, when this altar call is given and Charity sings mercy seat, you're going to get up out of your seat. You're going to fall on your face in front of that television set or in front of that radio. If you're driving in your car, you're going to pull off to the side of the road and you're going to say, dear God in heaven, I'm opening my eyes and I'm going to sit up and I'm going to receive life tonight. You do it, friend. Well... Your personal resurrection hinges on your response. Everyone stand. You know, something that just came to me is this woman's influence after being raised from the dead, far excelled her influence than before she died. Look here, folks. This woman's influence, after she was raised from the dead, far excelled what she had experienced, what she was allowed to do by God's grace and mercy before she died. Before she died, yes, she was a helper, she was a wonderful woman. But after she was raised from the dead, the Bible says, and it became known all over Joppa. Look at the influence of the woman now. Tonight, friend, if you let God raise you up, if you have God come into your corpse and speak life into it, and you'll sit up and sure, we're going to help you out. Friend, Peter helped her out. Peter lifted her up. You'll see there in the Scripture. He gave her his hand and raised her up. But that was after she opened her eyes and she sat up. If you'll go your part, God will go his. If you'll come down to this altar, we'll pray with you. You come down to this altar, we'll bless you. We'll pray over you. We'll pray heaven on you. But you're going to have to do something. And then the bottom line is, because of your changed life, it'll far excel 
anything that you've done up to this time, friend. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. You know, all rise. Peter rose to the challenge. The power of God rose to the challenge. Dorcas rose. She rose. All rise. All rise. How about it, friend? The Lord's doing his part. Preacher's doing his part. How about your part tonight? You want God to spiritually make you alive tonight, friend? Turn it all over to him. There's some young people listening to me. I want to tell you something, friend. I'm working on a, on a message right now. I don't know if I'm going to preach it this week or not called God Games. It's one of those tough messages. The Lord gave it to me early this morning. God Games. There's some of you that are playing. You're playing childish games. You remember the days when you take a board game, you'd be playing along, you didn't like the way it was going, you'd just start over? You remember you had a rule book? You're supposed to follow the rules. You didn't follow the rules. You just did your own thing. Life ain't like that, friend. This is the real McCoy. And some of you are straddling the fence. God ain't putting up with it. You know that there's something in your life between you and Jesus. You want God, but you want this other stuff too. It doesn't work like that, friend. You're dead. You'll stay dead. You'll be laying on that slab after everyone's dead and everyone's gone in this place. You'll be still laying on your slab. There'll be hundreds down here tonight getting right with God on fire for Jesus, raised from the dead. They'll leave out of here, friend. We get hundreds of letters in from all over the world. I'll never be the same again. I cry when I read them. It's incredible. They always start like this. I know you've heard this before, preacher. And then here they go. Here they go. When I came to the Brownsville Revival, and they start listing all the sins. Then by the next two or three pages, everything's changed, preacher. I'm so excited. All the sin is gone. My marriage is back together. My son and I spent the day together. We haven't talked like a, a son and a father and for as long as I can remember. I mean, friend, it just goes on and on and on. We get letters like that all the time, how God's raised people from their deathbed. But it's up to you tonight. You're going to be one of those that's stubborn, not going to do your part. He wants everything tonight, friend, everything. I want those of you with the chairs moving to the left and the right, please. No one else moving around. I tell you, folks, as they're moving the chairs, you know, there's a tug of war between heaven and earth on Dorcas. You know that? Earth wanted her and heaven wanted her. She's being pulled apart by both, both worlds. You know, the Lord just precious in his eyes are the death of his saints. Lord, I'm sure just wanted her home, and the, but the earth wanted her too. Raise her from the dead, Peter. What a, what a legacy for her, someone to leave, friend. I look at this tear bottle. I don't want people just to cry over me. Y'all listening? When you die, what good is that? Fill up a little bottle full of your tears. He was a good dad. He was a good this. He was a good that. I want there to be a tug of war over me. There should be a tug of war over you. The earth wants you and heaven wants you. You listening? Heaven wants you and the earth wants you. He was doing so much here. And the Lord's going, I want him home. We want him here. I want him home. Tabitha, arise. All right, you win. For now. I wonder if this story would have ever been in the Bible if she was a half-committed person. I don't think so. Doug, come get this. This is broken right here. 
if you break this, I'm going to explain something to you. This is a, you're a witness, all right? This is 3,000 years old. Okay? Mm -hmm. Do you feel this? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> it's made it 3,000 years. Make sure this makes it back to my study, okay? Here's that. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Piece of cake. Charity, I want you to come join me. You know, I felt at the beginning of this service, pastor turned to me and he said, Steve, the glory of God's in this place. I really feel that there's hundreds here that you plain old want to leave the past in the past. You want to get the sin out. You want to leave it at the altars of Brownsville. You want to leave the past here. Whatever it might be, whatever might be separating you from God, you just want to lay it down here. You might be here from, from, from New York, New York, Japan, Australia, Texas, California. They come from all over the world. 175 nations have come to this revival, and they continue to come. Every night, we add different nations, more nations that we've never heard of before. There's times that a nation will be mentioned. I'll turn to Mike, and I've never even heard of the nation. People are coming from all over the world. But let me tell you what you may look at and go, well, these are all just wonderful people. Friend, we've had unbelievable confessions from people that have spent thousands of dollars to get here from other places of the world. They've come to get right with God. They've come to get right with God. Now, many of them come for a fresh anointing, a fresh touch from God, but there's examinations that take place in this revival. We live in this all the time. We live under the scrutiny of the Holy Ghost, friend. I feel like every day I'm on the examination table with God. Paul said to examine yourself. Tonight, is there anything in your life between you and God? I remember a, a girl out in my, the, I was leaving out, and she came up to my window, she knocked on the window, she was crying her eyes out from Korea. And she said, I can't go back until God has forgiven me of this sin. And she, she was, it was hideous. She was squalling her eyes out. She said, will God forgive me? Another lady from Germany came and testified of being alcoholism and drug addiction. Came all the way from the revival. Friend, all the way for the revival to get to set free, friend. Make sure if you've traveled 3,000 miles that you come the last 30 feet. Make sure if you've come across this nation, make sure you come the last few feet, friend, to get right with God. See, this is plain and simple. This is bread and butter. This is a clear gospel. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John did not say, Behold the Lamb of God that will give you a three-bedroom house, two-car garage, and a half-acre of property. He didn't say that. Behold the Lamb of God who will put brand-name clothing on your back and, and put your kids through college. Behold the Lamb of God who will feed you filet mignons all the days of your life. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's all Jesus is into. That's all he's ever been into, friend. The beauty of it is, as you get the sin out, as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else is added. People marvel at the blessings of God. And people marvel at how our prayers are answered. We pray over that table. And people are, it's, it's got pictures of people from all over the world. And we'll get reports in this week of people that were saved and healed from this week's prayers over that. The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There's such of a thing as living a righteous, holy life, friend. There's benefits of living holy. There's great benefits. It's like an open heaven. That's nice. That's wonderful, an open heaven. When my kids do something wrong and they're hiding something from me, you can see it, can't you, parents? You can feel it. It's not fun to be around them. They don't want to be around you. But when everything's clear, they're a joy to be with. That's the way it's supposed to be with the Father all the time. A joy to be with the Father. So you can ask Him anything. Talk to Him all day long. You're not hiding anything from God. So tonight when this altar call is given, 
Here's what we're going to do. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone who's away from God, you're backslid, or you've never known the Lord, you're going to come in just a minute. Those of you that are backslid, that means at one time you had a relationship with God, but now you've drifted away. In just a minute, I'm going to give this altar call. You're going to come quickly. If you don't understand backsliding, friend, David Wilkerson used to say, if you're not closer to Jesus today than you were yesterday, you've backslid. That used to bother people, but I, there's a lot of truth to that, friend. If you can sit in front of a 35-inch screen and watch someone take their clothes off, you're a sinner. Period. What would Jesus do? Someone came the other night and put a little, they had a little placard about this big that they put on top of their TV set. It says, would Jesus watch this program? Powerful. Good question. Scary answers. But if you can sit there and watch something that Jesus wouldn't watch, you need to hit these altars tonight, friend. You need to hit these altars. Well, you're right, and I'm never going to watch it again. No, friend, you need to hit these altars. Quit trying to escape repentance. Repentance is good for the soul. Repentance will change you, friend. Break away. See, pride is what keeps you back tonight. Pride is what says, it says, what will my parents think? What will my boyfriend think? What will my, what will my wife, my husband think? What will my parishioners think? What will my pastor think if I go down there? Friend, let me tell you something. That's an egotistical statement because people aren't thinking that much about you, okay? All right? There's not thousands of people going, oh my, there he goes. No, friend. And chances are the one you're with is going, dear God, is that me? Is he speaking to me? Should I go to, you know, they're not really thinking about you right now. And if you go down, they're probably going to go, man, I wish I had the same guts she had. I wish I could be as honest about my life as she is, about it, as he is. So I wouldn't worry about what people think. Besides that, they're not going to stand in proxy for you in heaven. You're going to stand on your own before Almighty God. You were born into this world alone, and you're going to die alone, friend. You're going to stand before God alone. So this altar call is a lone thing. It's alone. You and Jesus. So if you're backslidden, friend, you're going to come quickly. Everyone's standing. Those of you at home, I want you to stand also. If you're in this room tonight, and how many are in this room tonight? Good. Still some folks. There going. It's not a trick question, friend. How many are in this room tonight? It's good. That's better. And you've never known the Lord. What can I say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. He'll be your best friend. We sang, oh, what a friend tonight. No, not one. There's not a friend like my lowly Jesus. No, not one. He's my friend. He's my buddy. He talks to me. I talk to him. I can come in this place and just lift my eyes and, and suddenly I'm just caught up and just worshiping him, loving on him. He puts me to sleep at night and wakes me up in the morning. He puts the birds out in the trees to sing to us. He puts the stars in the sky. He gives us the seasons. He lets us enjoy crisp fall weather. How many appreciate the crisp fall weather? You know, God didn't have to do that. He could have looked down at the world and said, arid climate, whole world now. Nasty. 93, year long, dry. But he didn't do that, friend. He gave many of us seasons to enjoy. I asked my wife the other day, I said, what's your favorite season? She said, I love springtime because winter's over and flowers are budding and the, the insects are flying, the bees are collecting pollen, and it's just a beautiful time of the year. And I told her, my favorite's this season right now. I love fall. I love autumn. I love the changing of the trees, the colors. But see, God gave us that. This is Jesus. That's Jesus. And he's in this room tonight. And he gave you all that. He wants to give you eternal life too. He's awesome, friend. I met him 22 years ago. He'll change your life tonight if you'll let him. No matter what you're into, he'll change your life. And there's another group of people tonight before Charity sings that you need to respond, and that is those who are religious. The religious. These are the people who attend our churches from coast to coast. 
and all over the world, those of you from Germany, you have Lutheran churches everywhere, Norway, Sweden, Finland. You have churches everywhere. But I want to ask you, how many people in the church know the Lord? Do they know him? Do they wake up in the morning with Jesus on their heart? Do they go to sleep at night with Jesus on their heart? Do they eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Are they consumed? Look this way, friend. Don't let anything distract you. Do they eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Are you like that, friend? Folks, listen. You can go to hell with baptismal waters on your face. I'm talking about adhering to the ordinance of the church. You can go to hell with a communion cup in your hand and a wafer in your mouth. You can go to hell serving soup at the rescue mission. Those things won't save you and you know it. I'm going to ask you, do you know him? Jesus said there's coming a time where people are going to say, in your name we cast out devils. In your name we did these mighty works. In your name we healed the sick. And they did, friend. But it was all in his name, but they didn't know him. He said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. What was that, friend? In the original, that has to do with lawlessness. They did it on their own, in the name of Jesus, but without Jesus in their hearts. I'm going to ask you right now, are you religious? Religion is hanging around the cross. Christianity is getting on the cross. This Christmas season, they'll be singing Christmas trees all over the nation. People will come to cantatas that never go to church, but once or twice a year, they'll go to the Christmas cantata. They'll go to some of them three and four times. They're cantataites, you know? Cantataholics. <laughs> they just love cantatas. What is that? That religious itch. It's Christmas. Okay, joy to the world, the, the first Noel away in them. It's a season, okay? It's the season. It feels good. But they can go home and drink a six-pack of beer right afterwards. Or they can get in the car on the way from the church and cuss out their wife. Friend, that's religion. That's religion. It'll damn your soul. I'm going to go ahead and say this about this. This, this has upset some people. But I believe that the hour the devil works longest at and hardest at every week is right before church. And I'm going to tell you, some of you are nodding your head, but he's not, he's not working Sunday morning. I believe he works harder Sunday morning than he does Friday and Saturday night. Most people on Friday and Saturday night are self-destructing. He's not out there and everyone in bars all the time. I mean, they're doing that to themselves. I mean, what's he got to hang out for? But Sunday morning, he's got every demon in town getting people ready to go to church. Getting them ready to go to church. If he could just get them in church somewhere so they can satisfy that one hour itch. Okay? Do their religious duty. Pastors, you know what I'm talking about. They'll come to church on Sunday morning, but get them to come to a special prayer meeting. Forget it. No, there's a ball game on, Pastor. What are you talking about? It's Monday night. Get real, Pastor. An hour? No way. But Sunday morning, boy, they'll come for an hour. The devil gets them in there and says, just go on, go on, go on, go on, go, on. go to church. That's religion. The devil's known about it from the beginning. If he can get man to be satisfied with a little bit, he'll think he's saved. He'll think everything's okay. And that's why people tell you, you say, are you a Christian? They go, I'm a Lutheran. You're a Christian, I'm a Methodist. You're a Christian, I'm Pentecostal. You're a Christian, I do this, I do that. Don't ask people that question. Look them in the face and say, I'm going to ask you a question and don't you lie to me. Do you know Jesus Christ? I mean, do you know him? Do you wake up in the morning with Jesus on your lips? Do you go to sleep at night with Jesus on your lips? Do you eat, drink, and breathe Jesus? Are you consumed with Jesus? That's the question. Here's how it's going to work. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone in this place that needs repentance, you need, to, you need forgiveness. You need Jesus Christ to wash your sins away. If you're going to hesitate, friend, I don't, I don't want anyone to come until charity begins to sing. Don't let pride hold you back. If there's something in your life between you and God, the Lord has spoken into you, and it's time, Tabitha, to arise. It's time to get up and come down here as quickly as you can and get it taken care of, man. And you're going to see the hand of the Lord. He'll reach down. He'll pull you, pick you right, right out of bed. 
He'll pick you out, friend. He'll raise you up and he'll use you as a testimony. Many will believe because of the change in your life. Some of you pastors, if there's anything between you and God, get it right here at these altars. We had a pastor baptized one night, been in the ministry 14 years, and he said to the congregation, I got saved at Brownsville. And he had been in the ministry 14 years. And he was honest, friend. That's the beauty of it. He was honest. He said, I did all that without ever knowing Jesus. Charity's going to sing Mercy Seat. Everyone who needs forgiveness, you're not going to hesitate. You're not going to wait. If you need the Lord to wash you clean, if there's sin in your life, something between you and Jesus, I want you to come quickly right now. If you don't know the Lord, I want you to come. If you've never known him, I want you to come right now. Hurry, 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 hurry. Come on right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry right now. Hurry, come on. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. Come on from the balcony. Come on. Come on. you sis come on take you the rest of the way. Come on, rise up right now. Get up right now and ask Jesus to wash you, cleanse you, forgive you, make you new. Come on, come on.
Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Little, if you'd play softly, I'd appreciate it. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. I'm going to close this altar call, and I'm going to tell you why. This, was not a, this story in the Word was not drug out. Peter spoke. The Bible doesn't say, he said, Tabitha, arise. I said, Tabitha, arise. I said, Tabitha, arise. Tabitha, get up. He said, Tabitha, arise. God has given you a word tonight, friend. I'm going to close this altar call in 60 seconds. You better come. You better come. When I begin this closing, you better come. Somebody here was disturbed about my statement concerning church. Let me tell you something, friend. I, I, I believe in Sunday morning church. I go to Sunday morning church. But Sunday morning church is not Christianity. Get that through your head. Jesus didn't die so you can go to a stained glass church on Sunday morning. Christianity was a whole lot more than that. Christianity is life. That means, friend, you're living it out on Mondays, through Fridays, through Saturdays, all day Sunday. It's not a Sunday morning phenomenon. So get over it. And you still got a problem with it. You need to take it up with the Father. Say to the Father, am I supposed to be on fire for your son all day, all day long, every day, all week long? What do you think the Father's going to say? Is what Steve Hill's talking about, is that true? Is everybody supposed to be so on fire for your son? They're fanatics for your son. Take it up to the Father. Talk to him about it. What do you think he's going to say to you? Oh, no, no. You can live like you want. Matter of fact, you don't need to talk about my son at all. You don't need it just on Sundays, just on Sunday morning. But you don't need to talk about him at all during the week. You don't need to, you don't need to do that kind of stuff. You think the Father's going to say that to you, friend? I don't think so. He might say something like, if you're ashamed of him, he'll be ashamed of you. He might mention the Scripture, if you're lukewarm, he'll spew you out of his mouth. If you're cold, you're doomed. If you're hot, you, you'll make it. But get over that, friend. You can be ticked at me if you want. But I want to tell you, this nation is sick and tired. That's why the nation is not standing in line to come to your church. And that's not lifting up Brownsville, friend. But I'm saying the Sunday morning thing is not what this nation wants. This nation wants Christianity Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. They want to see people live the Christian life. That's why so many thousands of teenagers are saved. Everyone at the altar, stay right where you're at. Keep your heads down. That's why thousands of teenagers get saved all the time at this Brownsville Revival. We can't hold them anymore, friend. We do everything we can to, to take care of these kids. They come from everywhere. Jocks, cheerleaders, all the way down to drug addicts and junkies and, and punk rockers. Why? Because they're finally getting a hold of true Christianity. They want to live it every single day. So get over it, friend, if you've got a hard time with that. 60 seconds. If you're coming, come now, right now. If you're coming, right now. Hurry, hurry. God bless you. Come on down. Come on. 55. God bless you, sir. 50. God bless you. I'm going to close. I've got to do this. Everyone at the altar, bear with me. Stay right where you're at. God's still dealing with your hearts. A lot of people just came again. They just came down. But there's somebody here you're just dying to say to the person next to you, maybe you brought them, I don't know, but you want to ask them if they'll go down there with you. Do they need forgiveness? And Lendl, I want you to play this one more time. If there's somebody next to you that you feel 
that you want to bring them down here and you just want to ask them if they, they need Jesus to forgive them, I'm going to give you time to do that right now. Then bring them down here with you. Bring them down with you. Let's go. Lord, have mercy. Come on. Come on, ask them. Lord, Come on. your heads down. Everyone at this altar, I want you to bow your heads right now. Close your eyes. We're going to ask the Lord to wash us, to cleanse us. If you're here and you've never known the Lord, he's going to do a mighty work in your life right now. He's going to come into your life. If you're here in this place and you're backslidden, the Lord is not only going to forgive you, friend, he's going to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. If you're in this place and you're religious but you don't know Jesus, he's going to change all that, friend. Yes. And from now on, you're not going to go to church to meet Jesus. You're going to take Jesus to church. That's the way it's supposed to work. Everyone at this altar, pray with me out loud. Do not mumble this prayer, friend. Pray it out loud. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for speaking to me. For speaking to me. Tonight, Jesus, tonight, Jesus, I have done, I have done what, Dorcas did. what Dorcas did. She opened her eyes, she opened her eyes and, she sat up. and she sat up. I'm doing that, Jesus. I'm doing that, Jesus. Now take my hand, take my hand and, raise me up. and raise me up. I ask you tonight, Jesus, I ask you tonight, Jesus to forgive me. To forgive I have sinned. I have, sinned. I have hurt you. I have hurt you. I've hurt others. I've hurt others. And I've hurt myself. I've hurt myself. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. Make me new. Make me new. I ask you, Lord. I ask you, Lord. To be my savior. To be my savior. My Lord. My Lord. And my very best friend. And my very best friend. From this moment on. From this moment on. I am yours. I am yours. And you are mine. And you are mine. Come live your life through me. Come live your life through me. And Jesus, Jesus. Just, as Dorcas just as Dorcas was used mightily, was used mightily in, the city of Joppa in the city of Joppa for many people, for many people to, be saved. to be saved. Use my life, Use my life. in my home, my home, in my area, in my area. for many, many to be saved. In your precious name, in, your precious name. in, Jesus, name. in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory. Hallelujah!